Hey everyone, this is Howie Ree, and this is the From Dorm Room to Startup series where we talk with entrepreneurs about what it was like to start their companies while they were still students at Duke. Um, I'm thrilled that we have Duke alum Brooks Bell, who is here with us today. And we're actually going to start uh, at a different point than usual. Um, Brooks had some big news that came in recently, and I'm going to let Brooks share the news. Brooks, what happened? Hey everybody, uh, I, so I graduated from Duke in 2002. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm 38 years old. And I just found out two months ago that I have been diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. So, um, so that's the big news. We just announced it and to the press today. And uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, the way I found out was in November, I was traveling for business and I noticed some blood in my stool. And, uh, you know, like anyone else, I went and Googled that because that seemed, you know, like a serious symptom. And the first Google result said that, you know, blood in your stool is a serious thing and not something you want to ignore. And so I didn't. I called a physician like that day. And they said that, you know, it's not, nothing to really worry about. It's probably just internal hemorrhoids. And that's very common that everyone gets it at some point. So I was super relieved and moved on, went to my business meetings. And, um, but the thing is, it didn't go away. It was still kind of happening a few days later. I mean, a week later. So over the holidays when I was back in Raleigh, I uh, saw another physician and they said the same thing. It's probably just internal hemorrhoids. Um, but at this point, it wasn't going away, and that just didn't seem, just didn't feel right. So I cold call a gastroenterologist, and, um, and they looked at my symptoms, and they said, yep, this is something we need to look more closely at, and suggested I get a colonoscopy. So I got that four days later, and before I uh, even left the clinic, they said they had found a tumor, and that it was almost certainly cancerous. So that's how I found out, and it was January 4th. Um, since then, I've had 10 inches of my colon removed and um, 16 lymph nodes, and, uh, and I've been recovering from this surgery for the last three weeks. And um, they were able to take a look at the, the tumor, and that's when they um, determined that it's stage three uh, because the tumor has gotten into a couple of lymph nodes. And so I'll be doing some chemotherapy starting in April. Um, but this the last few weeks, I've been just recovering from the surgery. And actually, that's why I am on a treadmill today from this, this interview is that I'm training for a 5k this weekend, uh, which is, it's called get your rear and gear, and it supports colon cancer awareness. I'll be speaking at it. Um, but because I'm going to be speaking, I really would like to finish the race. <laughs> and uh, three weeks ago when I got out of my surgery, I was walking. I was maxing out at five minutes for, at one mile an hour. And uh, I had, had some distance to cover. <laughs> so, um, so I need to – so I've got – this is my last training day, and I'm really trying to get – get, you know, spend at least, get at least 45 minutes or an hour on this treadmill. Um, so I can prove to myself that I'm going to be able to get this 5k done this week. Again. That's great. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing. I mean, it's such a, uh, a you know, you, you, you've always amazed me and, and, you know, you're really courageous to, to just kind of step out and, and talk about this and, and let people know. And so you, that's my daughter there giving a thumbs up. Um, and so uh, one thing that you've started um, is kind of to, to start to get the awareness for people under the age of 50 to get colonoscopies. Um, and I think this connects into to, to your story and, and a particular part of your story where um, maybe you did, kind of didn't think it was, uh, um, or somebody, other people were telling you maybe it's not a big deal, you don't, you don't need to yeah, bother yeah. getting a colonoscopy. So can you just talk about that initiative? Yeah, so with colonoscopies, I've been kind I've been familiar with colonoscopies for a while because my husband Jesse has who's also a Duke alum he has had family history and he's at high risk for colon cancer 
And, uh, and so I've taken him to get his colonoscopies, you know, every year or two um, for the last decade. And, uh, and so I've been familiar with them, but they, what I didn't really realize is that colon cancer is like, it's like the number three most common um, like, uh, cancer. And it's the number two highest uh, death producing um, uh, cancer. And so it's really dangerous and it's very common. Um, but the, it's the only cancer that gives you a huge heads up before you get it. Like if you get breast cancer, you already have it before you find it. You know, they find a lump and it's cancerous or it's not. With colon cancer, it starts as a polyp um, years before it turns cancerous. And up to 25% of adults have a polyp lurking in their colon for a decade before they get their first screening at age 50. So once, a, once, a, uh, once you have a polyp growing in you, then it may or may not turn into cancer. But what's so awesome is you can get those polyps snipped out ahead of time um, and basically effectively cure yourself from ever getting colon cancer. The thing is they're asymptomatic, so you have no idea if you have any polyps in you. And the only way to find out if you have polyps is a colonoscopy which is a super simple 30 minute procedure that, I mean, we should all be trying to get, you know, not just to deal with cancer, but to prevent us from getting cancer and to find out if we are polyp producers. So in my case, I've never had any stomach symptoms. I wasn't aware of any family history. And, um, but yet obviously I have been, I've had polyps growing in me for years. And if I had had a colonoscopy a few years ago, I would have avoided this whole thing. And that is what I'm trying to help educate others on is that they should be thinking about a colonoscopy as a way to discover if they have any polyps um, and if they're at higher risk and to therefore prevent this. Um, this is growing, colon cancer is growing at an alarming rate amongst younger people. And I don't think anyone is really paying attention to that being a risk. So, so that, that's, that's great information, and 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 I was thinking about how you know I'm, I'm 43. How would I operationalize this? Um, I, I've actually had a colonoscopy um, years ago, uh, but I'm just trying to think like you know if I call my general practitioner and I'm just like, hey, I'm thinking about you know getting a colonoscopy. Um, I I, I kind of wonder to myself, what if they just say, well, why would you do that? You know, you don't need it. I I wouldn't. I I don't prescribe that. I, I wouldn't agree with that. Um, and, and so just talk, talk a little bit about um, any tips or recommendations you might have for how a person would approach that conversation. Should it be with your general practitioner? Should you just schedule directly with, you know, a, a specialist? Talk about that. Well, insurance is not being super cooperative. Most insurance doesn't pay for it. If you're willing to pay for it yourself, then you can go get it at any time, you know? Um, you just, the risk is you have to pay for it. If you're willing to do that, then yes, go to your general practitioner. Um, or go to a gastroenterologist directly and just tell them you want one. Um, if you, you know, of course, it's better to have your insurance pay for it. And the, uh, those, the, it will only pay for it if you have family history. The thing is, I had no idea I had family history until recently. My grandfather had some colon issues. Um, if you have family history, they, you're higher risk and they will pay for it. Or if you have symptoms, and symptoms are, really broad. Um, bloating, gas, changes in your bowels is all count as symptoms. Um, anemia is another symptom. And of course, blood in your stool is a symptom. So I think this is where you can advocate for yourself. Um, if you have at least a few of those symptoms, I think you have a right to ask your, your, um, your general practitioner to refer you to a gastroenterologist and then really talk about how, how concerned you are about your symptoms. Um, and I, that's, that's a path forward that's, that's worth, worth taking. Got it, that's great. And, and just um, uh, talk a little bit more about um, uh, the website that you created for, for this movement. What, you know, what is the web address and uh, what are you what are you hoping happens uh, what what are you hoping people people should do yeah so we're launching this 
campaign this weekend called 50 Colonoscopies Under 50. And the URL is 50colonoscopiesunder50.org. And it's pretty straightforward. The purpose of it is to celebrate people who are under the age of 50 who have already gotten a colonoscopy and they found polyps. And therefore, they've you know, dodged a bullet of getting cancer in the future. And it's also to, for people to take a pledge that they intend on getting a colonoscopy this year as a result of getting more awareness um, and being inspired by the education that we are putting out there. Um, the goal is for us to use my diagnosis to educate everybody on how a colonoscopy is something we should all be looking for excuses to get when we're in our 30s. And it's not something we should be delaying. And it's something that is really not that big of a deal to get. It's safe, it's quick, the prep is, is easy. And it's not something that um, our current medical establishment makes it easy for us to, um, to advocate for ourselves on. Great. Um, so, so this, this, I'm sorry, so this campaign is to celebrate people. So we're looking for 50 people who've already gotten their colonoscopy and yep. who wants to publicly share that. Because, you know, one of the reasons we don't talk about colonoscopies is because it's in the, you know, and it's related to, your, um, to your, your colon, which is related to your butt, which is related to poop, and all the things that we're not supposed to talk about at the dinner table these days, certainly as adults. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, there's just not a lot of like, you just don't hear about it. And I think we need to start changing that. That's great. And, and the website is 50colonoscopiesunder50.org. And I'll, That's I'll, right. I'll put a link here. Thanks. Uh, but, you know, it's really awesome that you're, you're taking a leadership um, uh, position and doing that and, and just knowing you that that's, 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 that's so, so, so great that, that, that you're, you're willing to do that. And, um, you know, to get to like a kind of a personal kind of um, uh, reaction, if you will, to, to, to finding out you're diagnosed with cancer, um, you know, I, I know that a lot of people have posted probably videos over the years of, of what it's like to, to do that. I'm sure everybody has a different experience. Are you willing to share like what, what, what was it like to get that diagnosis and, and what went through your mind and, and how did you handle the next uh, hours and days and, and weeks? Well, we, I mean, I was shocked. Um, I mean, when the, doc, when the doctor came over and said that, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and, uh, and then a nurse came over and she's like, how are you feeling? I was like, well, pretty good, except I just got diagnosed with colon cancer. And she was shocked. She was like, well, and then she was like, aren't you upset? And I was like, oh, wait, yeah. And that's when I started crying. <laughs> it was just, it was so surreal. Um, I mean, I shed a few tears, but I just, it just really hadn't hit. And um, we came home and Jess and I were just, I just kind of stunned. And um, over the weekend, I mean, it was clear to me that I needed to make immediate changes um, in my life, that I couldn't continue as the CEO of my company um, because of what that role needs. It needs lots of travel. Um, it means a tough job. And it was clear that I could no longer do that. And that was really the, the hardest moment. Um, I mean, that is my, I've been running my company for 15 years and it's my entire adult life. And so I think that had the most heartburn for me. Um, and just having the uncertainty of like, what does that really mean? You know, what will people think? Well, what will my employees think? What will my partners and clients think? And um, so I, that was my immediate thought that I needed to make that change. And, um, and then I, the rest was, uh, you know, I knew there was a wide variety of, of um, outcomes when it comes to th this particular cancer. Um, survivability is all over the board. And the most important first question is whether or not it's stage four or not. And I wasn't going to know that for at least a week. So the first week was definitely the hardest because, you know, it could be not a big deal. It could be stage one. And barely important at all. It can be stage four, which is has a 14% survivability. And so stage three is what we, what ultimately it is, but it's stage three A, which is, um, has a 90% survivability. And once I'm done with chemotherapy, 
um, if I change, if I live a low stress life, eat well and exercise, drink less, um, I feel like I have a very good chance of it never coming back. Well, we'll, we'll obviously be, be, be wishing the same there. Um, so let's talk actually about, um, uh, about your company in, in present day and which you've now, uh, I think your new role now is uh, executive chairman and you've, you've handed over the CEO um, roles, which, which, you, uh, you know, as you, as you're saying, it's, it's a big deal and maybe it's even just hard to convey what a big deal, deal it is over, you know, just by saying it because, you know, it's been 15 years of your life, but it's, you know, the company is, is Brooks Bell. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's your name and, you know, I mean, just having known you for, I think we've been friends for, for 10 years now. I mean, I know you've poured your, your heart and soul into the company and, and have, you know, it has 50 people now that, that work there. And, you know, uh, you know, it's really, uh, it's an enormous, enormous change. Um, uh, are you able to just talk a little bit more about that? I mean, um, obviously you have somebody else that's going to become the, that is either already or is going to become the CEO. Just, Mm -hmm. What is that like just to, to hand over the reins? It's, you know, it's definitely hard, but I also feel very lucky. Um, I have got a great team. I've got, I've also, many of them have been with me for over five years. A um, few of them with me for 10. Um, Naoshi Yamauchi is my, kind of my right-hand man, and he's, he's my president. And um, so I've asked him to take over as the interim CEO, and um, and we've recently completed a, a reorg for the company that has simplified a lot of things, and um, I just have a huge amount of confidence in my team. And uh, I mean, it, the timing for this change really couldn't have been better. We had just completed a lot of these um, kind of improvements in, to how we operate, and had a lot of clarity. We had tons of strategic thinking last quarter. And so team has been like kind of ready to execute. And um, so I really have no qualms about, about what's going to happen. And um, so far the last month of, as I've been out re recovering from the surgery, um, everything is looking great. The team's doing great, but you know, it, it looking at once I'm through this chemo um, as executive chairman, I think is actually going to be good for the company because it allowed me to focus a lot more on thought leadership and speaking and relationship building, um, things that I really enjoy doing and leave more of the day-to-day -day operations um, to my team and our new CEO. And uh, I think there'll be a much more balanced uh, and more you know, high leverage way of operating. That, that, that's great. And, and so, um, Let's transition now to talk a little bit more about kind of the company present day. So um, most Duke students who are watching this video, um, you know, uh, and everyone else watching this video, they, they may not understand what it is that your company does. So can you just explain a little bit about what does the company do? Sure. So we are a customer centric uh, experimentation consultancy. And what that means is that we work with lots of large organizations like American Express and Gap to optimize their websites, um, help them drive more value from their, from their websites, make their websites easier to use, and make the company more data-driven. And the way we do that is by running experiments on the website that are fundamentally customer-centric, that are structured around understanding more about what customer intent is, who their customers are, what are the most important segments, and how to use their data to personalize these experiences so that the overall experience is better. Um, the customer, their companies are getting a better understanding of who their customers are and what they need, and everything is backed by data. And on top of that is statistically significant. So, uh, Brooks, can you give a specific example for students as to like what would a client come to you and ask for, and you know what would what would they be asking you for, and and how long does that kind of how long would that engagement work for, and what what, what would you deliver back? Well, I wish there was a single example. Um, I mean, it's we do a lot of different things. Uh, we help them start a uh, an experimentation program figure out who to hire, how to organize 
this type of process, you know, should live in marketing or, or product or IT or analytics, who, you know, what, what type of people they need and how to design a process. Um, and then also how to create a methodology. Like how do you, how do you choose what to test in the first place? Like we can all come up with test ideas, but how do you really justify those, those test ideas? Make sure they're actually customer centric and that you're going to learn something from them. And then how to design a, an experiment, you know, the statistical background um, to call a winner, um, how to know how many variations you can afford to put in your test, given your traffic, all of that. And then how to use a technology. We partner with companies like Optimizely and Adobe that enables the, uh, their ability to run these types of experiments. And so how to, how to um, leverage that technology uh, within the rest of their technology stack. So that's one of the things we also help them. If they have an existing one, how do, they, how do we help them make it better, <laughs> solve their problems they have with their process or technology? Um, and if they just really want us to, if they really just want to make a bunch of money and get a bunch of wins, you know, make their website better, they don't really care about doing it themselves, and they can just hire us to uh, create, like, you know, 20 tests for them, and uh, we'll design them, we'll build them, We'll do it all for them and then come back a year later and say like we've made you you know ten million dollars you know delivered a hundred x roi or whatever it is um and have the data back it up cool cool that's great all right now i'm gonna hit the uh hit the the, the time machine button and go back to uh go back to freshman year and go back to kind of the core of this from dorm room to startup series here which as i mentioned earlier is all about uh, really talking about the experience of being an undergraduate and starting a company while you're an undergrad. You know, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, when they talk about starting a company as an undergrad, it usually ends up just as a footnote. It's not like the whole story. Mm -hmm. And they focus mostly on all the great success that they had afterwards. Yeah. Uh, you've had a lot of success, um, but it's really trying to demystify, you know, uh, that process as an undergrad, because I think too many undergrads say like, oh, it's like, it's too hard. It's yeah, it's too different. Can't imagine going from point A to point Big. Z, you know. Exactly. So, so just talk about, um, you know, coming to Duke and and your first year at Duke. What was that like? Yeah. So I grew up in Alaska, and uh, and very excited to get out of the state. <laughs> it's cold, dark, lots of mosquitoes. It's beautiful, but uh, um, but I was looking forward to the North Carolina sun. And so my mom was the first female orthodontist in Alaska, and my dad was the first immigration attorney in Alaska. And uh, so they're both small business owners. And, um, you know, I wanted to do as well as they did, you know, like any young, uh, promising Duke student, I certainly want to be successful. And, uh, but I had no idea how I was gonna, you know, how I was, how I was gonna do that. And um, they wanted me to get some entrepreneurial experience. And I met uh, my husband, uh, his name, Jesse Lipson. I was, he was a junior and I was a freshman. We met at the Duke Carolina game in 1999 and immediately hit it off. And uh, he was kind of getting wrapped up in the whole dot-com uh, mania, the first dot-com mania. And uh, was trying, he was doing a startup because, you know, I don't know the, the startup, um, uh, the startup, uh, all the startup um, stuff really hadn't picked up at, at Duke yet. So we we're doing this in a vacuum. Um, so I wanted to hang out with him, but he was busy with all his friends and all his junior friends. And I wasn't really part of it. And I was lonely and miserable. I was hanging out in a basement full of cockroaches off campus basement and it just sucked. And, uh, and I was like, hey, you know, if I'm, if I want to hang out with this guy, you know, I really kind of need to get entrepreneurial myself. And, uh, and that's kind of how we got started. <laughs> his, his startup, thank God, failed. Uh, didn't get anywhere. And then he didn't have a job because he had been spending all his time on his startup. So he decided to stick around because he was unemployed. And <laughs> I took advantage of that. And we started a website company together when I was, um, you know, finishing my sophomore year and he was, I just graduated. So, uh, and so, so we, so we, we started our first company together. So that was, that was sophomore year, but so wait, there was also tuition. <laughs> 
pain. Yes, yes. That was, so let me back that, up. Yeah. So summer, right? yeah, let me talk about that too. So um, I kind of skipped that. So before, kind of when he was thinking about starting his, um, doing his startup, his failed startup, I was thinking about how do I convince my parents to let me stay in Durham over the summer? Um, they wanted me to come home to Alaska. You know, I was 18 years old. Most parents want their freshman children to return home after the first year because, you know, you're young and uh, parents are still attached to you. And I just did not want to go home. I wanted to stay in Durham because I, I was like super into, into this boy and he was staying here. So I needed a good excuse. And I saw this um, flower, uh, flyer in the Bryan Center that said, don't, run a, don't get a summer job, run a summer business. You know, join tuition painters. And it was a franchise painting company. And so I was like, oh, this is exactly what I need. You know, my parents will, they're both, they run small business. They'll, you know, see this entrepreneurial experience I'm going to get. And uh, it's exactly what I need. I can only do it here in Durham. So I pitched them. They bought it. <laughs> I bought a 1974 uh, Chinook truck. It was barely operational. Turned it into a paint mobile. I went around Durham painting um, really run down houses. Uh, and I got to hang out with, with my boyfriend all summer. And we it was amazing. And, and the promise from tuition painters was like, you can make profits of, of oh, yeah. thousands $5,000, $1,000. I lost thousands of dollars. It but was so, a total scam. The whole talk thing. about that. So how did you, like you're, you're painting houses. So obviously some money is coming in. How, yeah. How well, the, ended up the problem them? is the problem is the contract I signed said, it looked straightforward. It said I have to give them 25% of my revenue. Um, and then I, and then I'll buy the, no. So if I was, and that felt, that felt reasonable. 25% didn't seem like that big of a deal. But the problem was I misunderstood the difference between revenue and profit. I interpreted it as profit and it was, it's not profit. Basically, if I sell a thousand dollar deal, they take $250 off the top. Then I sell $50 left. Then I buy the paint. Then I pay the painters. And if anything goes wrong, like anything that's left over comes to me, I'm like literally the last person to get paid. So if something goes wrong, I'm holding the bag. Um, the first people who get paid are the corporate, you know, overlords. So they have no risk, zero risk in the in the whole deal. So I just didn't understand that. Um, are you willing to and, share? Are, are you willing to share like how much you were you in debt by the end of that? I was like in debt, debt like two thousand dollars. Which is um, I maxed out like 10 credit cards, all the ones I got as a freshman, like they would give me like a, you know, $500 or something of, uh, you know, of credit, maxed them all out. And, um, it'd be the only way I was able to get out from underneath this is I sold my paint mobile at the end of the summer for like a thousand dollar profit. <laughs> uh, and I packaged all my, my ladders, everything. And, and, uh, sold it really fast and so that paid down a bunch of that debt and wow. um and i was like my takeaway after that was like never again am i going to get into credit card debt that sucks and never again am i going to like just blithely sign a contract without really understanding it um and i mean i was kind of soured on the whole idea of entrepreneurship for a little while because i had just been right. <laughs> so screwed by it right and uh it was so after that I went and got an internship at a, at one of the dot com um, you know the early dot coms here in the Research Triangle Park. Um, it's called Auction Rover, which is now um, Channel Advisor, um, and is uh, IPO'd a few years ago. Um, and I was just so thrilled to be able to sit at an air conditioned cube with my own my own uh, computer, and I was like not running around you know, the most dangerous parts of Durham in 100 degree heat, and you know, in this junker. I mean, it was just like such a luxury to an actual paycheck. And just, but that's how I got into like digital. I ran an affiliate program for dot com. So it was right, right. So it's step in the right direction. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting like thread that you, you know, mm -hmm. and so, you know, uh, channel advisor, Scott, Scott Wingo, who's, who's still mm -hmm. a local entrepreneur, um, uh, and, and a huge supporter of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. It's really interesting that you did, you know, affiliate stuff and digital stuff. And, you know, here you are years later and, and you're, you're still doing, I think, you know, digital stuff. I think that's fair to say. And, uh, 
That's really cool. So, yeah. so okay, so you and Jesse, uh, so you do an internship, and then at some point you and Jesse say, like, let's go ahead and um, start a company. And, and, and actually just two, two, two other questions here, just to add some color around, around your experience at Duke. Um, what, what was your major and like, what else were you involved in outside of the experiences we've talked about so much so far? Well, my, my major was in psychology and um, uh, I loved it. I mean, I thought psychology is something that you can apply to anything, but I also felt like I was coming from the Alaska public school system. I was not prepared to, um, for the academic rigor at Duke and was pretty intimidated by my other, by the other students. And, um, and so I, I somewhat selected psychology because it didn't seem to require really deep, like, like it, I didn't have to go to any labs. I didn't have to like, you know, I didn't need to have, I'd never took calculus in high school. So I didn't have to do any like math. I didn't have to, um, there was no like long, like, um, Art, you know, uh, lot, there wasn't a ton of writing I had to do and, um, or like really critical reading. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> so it felt like a, a pretty straightforward of, you know, it was like kind of a basic, broad skill set. Um, and it was about people, learning about how people think and, and behave. And then I learned stats as part of it. And um, stats is probably one of the best things I learned um, from my major. Hello. Cool. Hey. <laughs> My daughter there. Wait, where is it? The charger in the basement behind the desk. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, that's great. And and so, you know, my wife, my, my wife studied psychology too. And so, and talk about, um, if you don't mind, uh, were you involved um, in any other extra curriculars, clubs? Or yeah, other? I was. I was in the marching band, and uh, was you know. So I went to all the Duke football games <laughs> suffered through those it was before we got a better team and uh and actually that's how I met Jess I was in the band um at the marching you know I was in the that band for the Duke Carolina game um so I played the tenor sax and also involved in uh the sorority uh system I was a DG and you know really enjoyed being part of that and but pretty much after I met um Jess and got involved in our startup. I really started focusing on that pretty heavily. You know, we, I mean, we, we were, I was working uh, mostly full time by the time I was a senior on the startup and graduated early, early. And also I spent a lot of times at, at my internships um, and actually having internships at the various tech companies in the area really helped me understand what I cared about, what I, what I liked doing, what I didn't like doing, helped me understand all the different options out there. And um, and also helped me do better in school because it gave me more structure in my day. So, so to talk great. a little bit, so so let's go back now chronological. So it's sophomore summer, you and Jesse mm -hmm. say we're going to build website for for somebody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what was the website you build and uh, built, and how did you teach yourself how to do that? So he, uh, so his dad um, had a kind of a side business. And his website sucked. My mom had a side business and her website, she really didn't have a website. And so, um, and Jess graduated with no job. And I gave him, for his graduation gift, a, um, I bought him a copy of the um, Dreamweaver, which was the main website, you know, software at the time. And so give him the ability to build websites. He was, he was a philosophy major. So neither of us were technical at all. So we gave him a copy of that and he built a, website for his dad using that. It was like, you know, it was a cut and paste, you know, drag and drop, really straightforward. Um, I decided to build a, the homepage of a website for my mom for a Christmas gift. Um, she loved it. She was super impressed. You know, they both said, oh my God, you guys are amazing. We were, we were not amazing, but you know, just every parent thinks you are. And uh, but we, we believed them and thought we should do this full time. Um, and also, we, Jess had helped project manage a website for, um, he did eventually get a job locally with, another, with a startup here, and they put him in charge of getting their website done. He worked with a professional web develop, uh, development company, but it demystified how easy it is to build a website. And so, and he paid them, the company paid them like $5,000. And we thought, wait, 
if we can get paid $5,000 for a website, like that will pay all of our expenses for six months. Like that's a ton of money. So that we felt like we could easily sell one website, $5,000 website every six months. And having that confidence is what helped us pull the trigger. And, you know, me quit my, we both quit our jobs and uh, started doing that full time. Do you, do you remember your first, your first sale or, 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 or I guess yours and Jesse's first sale here? What, what was your first? Well, once we, <laughs> we, uh, well, let's not count, you know, my mom's website or his dad's or my mom's friend's website, you know, but the first sale that was not family related was for another Duke, um, a, a Duke connected startup called MD Everywhere, started by Ben Feldman, who's a pretty prominent entrepreneur here in the triangle. We had courted him for months to earn the right to build the website for that company. They had maybe 80 people. And we basically almost built the whole thing before we even got the job. He eventually told us to stop doing the work until, and then he said, we got the job to stop doing the free work. Here, you know, I'm gonna pay you. And, um, and we were, we felt that like, if we, if we over index on customer service and, you know, drive, we'll get the work. And it paid off. I mean, we were really proud. So this reminds uh, me of that. This reminds me of something you, you, you said years ago, is that um, early on, and I, I don't know if this was the start of it or if, or if you decided to earlier on maybe do it during tuition painters or, or something else. You said something like, you know, we will charge, uh, I'm sorry, we will, we will do everything to make the customer happy. You were like, we will babysit the customer's kids if that means that they will be happy. And it's, it's really stuck, stuck with me, obviously. I mean, I can't remember when you said it. It's, it's been at least five years since you said that. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, like, I see it everywhere now. Like, that, that's the right mentality and that there are, there are other companies that will, like, kind of nickel and dime you and, like, that will just ruin the relationship. So can you just talk a little bit about how, how did you come to that insight with Ben? Yeah. Well, the beginning, it's not about profitability. You know, you're not, like, you're trying to – kind of get your credit, your, it's about credibility, you know? It's about having people who will, who have your back, you know? And we needed that portfolio. We needed people like Ben to really believe in us. And so our first phase was getting that group of people who we had earned their trust, um, who are able to advocate on our behalf. And to do that, you just need to like blow them away with, with your skill and your dedication. And, and of course you're gonna lose a ton of money on those things. It's not really about that though. You're building the foundation of people who trust you. And um, I mean, having trusted relationships is everything. And you know, at the beginning and at every point after that, I mean, my, um, I mean, just, just his current startup is about, you know, basically building your network of relationships and building that trust, you know, it's, um, and that is the foundation of everything we've done. I think what I would say now is that, you know, at some point, um, you, you need to be focused. He shouldn't be babysitting as, you know, you shouldn't do anything possible, but just because you need to be focused on, um, on your goals, but it's still, you know, the idea that you do need to make them happy at all costs. Cool. So, so let's go back to the chronological story. So, so you sell the first website to, to Ben Feldman um, and you're, you're, you're like, wow, this is enough money to serve five for, for X months. Um, I'm guessing that we're, we're in kind of like sophomore, summer, junior year now. You, mm -hmm. you still have two more years to do this and, and Jesse's graduated. He's maybe working on it possibly full time, I guess. Just talk through junior and senior year. What, what happened for you junior and senior year? Um, well, I was working on this, and um, Jess, his um, his dad unfortunately passed away unexpectedly, and so we started running his company as well, his dad's company. And um, so between uh, our company, which is called Novel Projects, and his his dad's company called Rapid Data, um, every hour that I was not in school. I was focusing on helping, you know, work, run these two companies. And then eventually we realized that um, with a website company, um, we, 
we didn't have time to do the work and also sell new work, you know, like, but we needed to have a pipeline for new website projects. Um, and, and so we brought on two other uh, Duke graduates, two of our friends, um, as, as our partners, who also had more technical background. They both had a background in um, computer science. And, you know, we're also just great, you know, charismatic, well-rounded guys who could also help us sell. And, uh, and it did help. It helped us build, grow the business. And we were able to do much more complicated projects, like we built the um, Duke Divinity School website, which is a 300-page website, and it was by far the largest website we'd ever done. Um, but the problem was, I mean, this went along for fine, fine, but one mistake that we made in bringing on our two friends was that we, um, we made them equal partners in every way. And we drew up a um, shareholder agreement that said that every decision needs to be unanimous. Um, you know, they're our friends. We trust them. They trust us, you know. Uh, and we should all be on the same page. The problem is that he does not anticipate ever having a problem and doesn't give you any ability to resolve it, you know? Um, and, uh, and ultimately that destroyed the company. Um, the, they, you know, once we started getting successful, uh, we had a, you know, a disagreement that we couldn't, we couldn't resolve. They wanted to build software. Um, I wanted to continue. I had, and that by that point, which we'll come back to this, you know, I gotten a pretty big opportunity with A-B testing, want to pursue that. And we couldn't, we couldn't figure it out. We hired a mediator and uh, they said, you know, you, you, you just, you can't operate like this. This company is not going to be successful. You need to shut it out, shut it down and go your separate ways. And so that's what we did. And that is how we started ShareFile, uh, which is a product that Jess built. Um, along with one of the partners, and that's how I started Brooks Bell. Um, and this was in 2003, shortly after I graduated. So that's that's 2003, shortly after you graduated. And I and I think that um, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the, there was one other interesting thing, which I, I'm pretty sure you all lived and worked out of the same house. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. That were yes. Yeah, so this this is the house that had all the cockroaches. Um, there was a, uh, it was a four bedroom house and I had, I was sort of a last addition to this house. I mean, when they got, when the guys committed to living together, I wasn't in the picture. So, um, there wasn't quite enough room and I really wanted to be there. So we, Jess and I took the unheated garage, uh, and you know, it was the biggest room in the house. So, but you know, it was already occupied with the, by the cockroaches and. Okay. Um, I got it. So, so, so Jesse's already living there. You're still living on campus. There's cockroaches, uh, and then you move in, and then you and Jesse take the unheated garage, and you're working from there. You're living, you're sleeping there at night, and and you're working from day, hopefully from the heated area. True. Yeah. Uh, well, I was. I would mostly go to class. Um, he would. Yeah. He would work from the heated area, right, right. with one of his friends. Wow. And, and, and that was in that was that was in Durham, this is, right? This was in Durham. Yeah, just off uh, Alexander, I, I think, okay. and um, and we um. And also another kind of fun fact is that there was no broadband at the time. We had called, we had five dial-up lines um, ported in that Jess and I personally installed. We like, we wired the house um, for five telephone lines so that we could all have our own AOL uh, dial-up account. <laughs> so, okay, so, so that company, which was called Novel Projects, so that company has a, 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 a schism in, in 2003, it splits. Novel yeah. Projects remains, you start Brooks Bell, and Jesse starts um, Share File. And, yes. and, and so the punchline is that Brooks Bell um, grows and, and is what, what you currently um, uh, are the executive chairman of, uh, 50 people, tons of clients, 15 years of history and expertise, um, I, I mean, I think it's safe to say that you're one of the top consultancies in, in your area, maybe the top consultancy. Yeah. And ShareFile um, also does quite well, ends up getting acquired. Um, Jesse ends up uh, working at Citrix. That goes really well. And now is on his, his next startup. So 
that's just kind of the punchline for for any students that are watching. Is that roughly correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, the guys were right when they said a product, you know, has a better future. You know, they they proved that out. You know, ShareFile did great. It was acquired for almost a hundred million dollars in 2011, and um, and then Jeff stayed there for another five years. And when he finally left, they had almost a thousand employees and um, a really beautiful office space in downtown Raleigh. So he created a ton of value and a uh, really inc remarkable story. Uh, whereas mine is services company, you know, same period of time, I've got 50 people, but you know, we're solving for a very different problem and it's not nearly as scalable, but um, we've, uh, it's, but it's been like personally for many years, um, it was much more profitable for the first five or six years than ShareFile. And it's been just kind of like, you know, slower growth, stable, and um, it's a great business, you know, great lifestyle. And, and just so students um, understand some of the, the numbers behind it. So, uh, you know, you, you were selling websites for, uh, you know, a few thousand dollars back, you know, as a sophomore, junior. Um, how much does an engagement with Brooks Bell go for? I mean, we don't, we don't need to know exact numbers, but what's the order of magnitude well, here? Yeah, I mean, the range, somewhere between $100,000 and a million dollars. Um, you know, average engagement might be, you know, four to 600,000. Um, we try to do year long engagements. You know, we're not like a McKinsey where it's millions of dollars, but um, you know, it's hundreds of thousands. It's, we put a pretty big team on every engagement, but the thing is we make our clients millions and millions of dollars. Now we pay for our engagement like many times over easily. And that is what I'm really proud of with our business model. That's great. Um, so we have a lot of students that are um, struggling to figure out kind of both what they want to do in life, like what's their purpose in life, um, but also kind of figuring out, you know, what skills, what should they be, become good at? You know, if they're going to learn some sort of skills, what, what should they mm -hmm. become good at? And, and they struggle with both, both parts of that. And I feel like you have some really great insights because um, um, you've hired many people and, 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 mm -hmm. and Jesse's hired many people. And you, I know you talk a lot about everything with, with respect to your businesses, I think. So um, if, if you were to give advice as to, you know, what skills people should learn while they're in college, mm -hmm. that'd be awesome. Um, and and we'll, we'll stop there. But then the next question that I'm going to follow up with is like purpose, you know, and I feel like you've gone through a really amazing experience over the years where, where you've been just very real about, you know, finding kind of um, your purpose and your company's purpose and whatnot. So uh, maybe sharing a little bit about that. So, I, but we'll, we'll start with skills. Right mm -hmm. now, what what skills do you think uh, you would advise students to consider studying? I mean, my, I mean, there's tons of options. I mean, people love become product managers and engineers. You know, there are a lot of a lot of people talk about that. But one one I what I think one of the most exciting areas is is analytics. Um, when you think about it, I mean, analytics is not math. It's totally different. I mean, statistics is an amazing skill to have or under, to understand statistics. Um, but to be able to uh, interpret data and is really, if you think about it, the foundation of strategic thinking. Data visualization, to understand the data and what it really means, where the data really came from and how this translates into you know, who your customers are and what they want and also what the business needs. Um, Incredible skill to be able to communicate that. Incredibly valuable. That is how, and it's how you gain power in an organization and um, gain influence to be able to take data. But it also, not, you know, it gives you power, which is, you know, we all, we all like having influence, but if you really understand the data, it also helps you, gives the opportunity to have like integrity um, to combat other other people who have opposing data, you know, if you can really tell a narrative of, of your customers, um, and weave in different types of data, um, qualitative and quantitative, uh, that send different messages, but bring, bring, make a coherent narrative. That is like, um, the most, the most incredible thing you can do, um, 
uh, for all stakeholders. And, uh, and there's a big market for it. I mean, every, every new piece of software that's built creates data. And, you know, software is eating, eating the world, you know? Everything is gonna have software. So, you know, there's not nearly enough analysts to deal with this data. And, um, and if this data is in the hands of people who don't know what they're doing, bad decisions are gonna be made, and it's gonna be, data will be weaponized for specific agendas. And uh, I really want smart, authentic, high integrity people um, who care about creating those, those narratives uh, to, to be in that role. I think Duke students would be great for it. Great, and, and, and so, you know, kind of the, made, the classic majors maybe, uh, and I don't, I don't think the classic majors actually fit in with uh, kind of data analytics. <laughs> data right? visualization, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe they think like, I'll, I'll take statistics, I'll take math, mm -hmm. or, or maybe they're thinking like, I'll get a job um, in data science, although a lot of times mm -hmm. the data science jobs require like a PhD or master's things. Uh, t tell the tell tell folks um, tell students like what's what's a good foothold that that you look for when when you're when you're when you're thinking about how people kind of got into analytics. There is a master's degree at NC State that um, that is really fantastic. Um, Dukes, you know, if you really want to take it seriously, that is a great uh, holistic um, degree. That it's the Institute of Advanced Analytics that Duke students can take after they graduate. I think it's like another year. While at Duke, you know, you can you have plenty of options. You know, just take as many statistics classes as you can. Um, then get a standard a liberal arts background. So you're thinking about, you know, about people and, um, you know, society and literature um, so that it's not just one-sided about the black and white data. You know, you need to, you need to be able to understand all the nuances between between these relationships. And um, I think we have a balanced approach to the black and white hard sciences with the soft fuzzy sciences. I think you'll be prepared. Um, and then get specific, some specific training um, by taking a specialized course afterwards if it's not offered at Duke that will help you understand the technology out there and uh, all the you know, different types of data sets that you would um, need to master. Great, and I, I think that I'm I'm uh, uh, I, I need to give a plug for um, Fuqua's data science and data analytics programs. There's the um, is there a new one? I'm yeah, not aware of it. Quantitative management. Uh, Perfect. Program at Fuqua. So take that one instead. Yeah, everyone, every student should should learn about the Fuqua Masters of Quantitative Management programs. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a health analytics and the business analytics. Okay, now let's let's go to purpose, um, and then and then we'll wrap up after that uh, that Brooks. So. Uh, and actually, I do have a I do have a few students here. So if if the students want to um, privately uh, uh, chat me a question here, um, I, I'll, I'll let them ask you if, if that's okay with you, Brooks. So um, so the question for you, Brooks, is uh, and Francesca, I'm going to mute you here. The question for you, uh, Brooks, is purpose. So can you talk a little bit about um, did you like have you identified your purpose over the years, and maybe now the purpose is you know, beat cancer or, you know, <laughs> uh, you know and, and maybe there's multiple purposes. I don't know, but, you know, have you found purpose over the years and, and, and maybe just talk, talk, talk about the arc of that from when you were a student at Duke to, to kind of how, how that, how that yeah. has evolved, if it's, if it's evolved over the last um, 15 or so years. When I was a student at Duke, I was struggled like a lot with that question. I mean, I remember struggling with that question. I was struggling with the, the idea of vision. I was like, what the hell is a vision? You know, how do I know if I have a vision? You know, I just, it was just these, these vague, I was like, what's the difference between strategy and tactics? There's all these like high level concepts, just really hard to know when you've like got it. Um, purpose is something that I continue to struggle with, you know, for a decade afterwards. Um, and when I was really, I mean, it was kind of felt like it's part of the equation of like, you know, to get to your happiness. You know, you feel like you gotta have to be successful you have to find love you have to you know find peace you gotta have purpose you know so we talk about this a lot but i think purpose is the hardest one to know when you when you're there the way i like to think about it is it's not black or white you know um i don't think purpose is ever about making money um i mean that is fulfilling something else you want to be successful but that's not purpose um i think 
it's and and you kind of need to have a something really hard, like a really meaningful challenge um, to overcome. Like basically, fulfillment is always part of overcoming a really hard, meaningful challenge that's really, really difficult that you almost fail at. The people who have the most purpose are the ones you know, who get things like cancer or they lose, you know, have a loved one that dies, like a child who dies of cancer, and they're so upset about it, now they know exactly what they need to accomplish the rest of their life. Or sometimes it's like a bus driver who, who has a simple life, and their entire life purpose is for their child to go to college for the first time. You know, they're simple things, but they are just like these big goals that are outside of themselves. Um, solving a problem that is not about you. And it has nothing to do really with your success. Um, and so it's hard to have like deep purpose until you have like a personal challenge that is about, give, that leads you to really want to solve that problem or so, or or give back to people um, because this problem was so difficult for you and you feel the energy and emotion that is related to that. If you don't have that, that's okay, you know, it's all right. Um, one day you're gonna have something that's gonna give you purpose. Um, until then, focus on other problems like checking the box on feeling successful and making your parents proud of you. Check the box on finding a relationship that really makes you happy. I mean, for me, I have no shame. I wanted to find um, a husband while I was at Duke. That was my number one priority. It was not about my career. I felt I was just trying to be rational. I was like, you know, your most important decision in your life is who you marry. And it, like at Duke, everyone is like, there's so many boys here. They're all single. They're all qualified. It's like, you know, shooting fish in a bowl. Might as well get this done now before all the good ones are taken. You know, that's, that is my, that's my goal. So check the box quickly. And then I was able to focus on my career afterwards. <laughs> So I'm, I'm glad I, I approached it that way. So, you know, focus on your career and, and finding love and then worry about purpose later. It'll, just, it'll come to you. And, and can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, pre-cancer, um, how, how would you have described either your purpose or, or, or the purpose of the company? And, and, you know, those are probably two different things. But yeah. uh, again, I, 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 I just respect that you've thought a lot about this over the years and, and just kind of want to give you a chance to, to just uh, share a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, the purpose of the company is different than the purpose of, of, of myself. Um, I mean, they're related, but the purpose of the company for the first uh, decade was to eradicate bullshit in marketing. I felt like, which is really, really saying I want data. Data is what eradicates the bullshit. Let's get people using their data to drive their decisions not just their intuition. So I was trying to get people excited about data. People are excited about data now, so that is no longer our purpose. Um, is now focused on helping companies discover the people behind the data. So now it's kind of back to people, it's about being customer centric is the purpose of the company. So it's more like what problem are we solving and how do we get energy by, you know, among our, our, our team and our clients that that's a worthy problem to solve. Um, for me, you know, my life is not just about my company. It's, um, I mean, it's a huge part of my company. I mean, and that's actually probably something that's one of the best things about dealing with this health, health crisis is that it's given me time and space to think about what is my broader purpose that's not related to my company. Um, but my, it's always been about, um, my relationships. Um, you know, my relationship with Jess has been incredibly important. It's been about um, having balance, as much balance as I can. Um, just having, being good to my body, protecting my health, and resting, you know, finding the areas that, you know, just the skills that I don't have and just trying to get a little bit better in lots of other places. It's, you know, that's just, I haven't had like, and then of, of course, helping people with entrepreneurship. Um, starting HQ Raleigh, helping, um, other young people who have come behind us, going down the same path, helping them, uh, you know, have an easier time. These days, I'm focusing a little bit more on, on women specifically. I'm, a, I'm on the board at um, 
private boarding school, all girls school here in Raleigh, uh, St. Mary's. And you know, these high schoolers, these women, helping them with their confidence and helping them be, you know, become leaders and, uh, and preparing them to, to, go to, to go to college. So those are the other projects that I have. Um, but I'm just really trying to be present on the day to day and enjoy my life and, you know, yeah. That's great. So, um, uh, let's wrap it up and, and then I'll end the video. And if any students have questions and if you have a few more minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll take those questions um, after the video is done here. So, um, the wrap up is, uh, you know, you, you have so many, um, insights that you found for yourself, for your company. Um, and, and you've already shared a, a few specific insights for, for Duke students and, and what, should they, what should they be thinking about when they're in college. But I just wanted to pause and, and give you a chance to, to just say, um, you know, are there any other insights that you would like to, 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 to give students or any other pieces of advice? You know, how should they approach their time in college? But how, also, maybe how should they approach that first step as they're, they're making it at, out of college? Mm -hmm. Well, have fun in college. You know, it's a uh, it's a great memory, and and uh, there's so much pressure these days that you don't need more. You know, just enjoy it. You're going to be successful. You're you 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 will be successful. You're already very smart. You're successful for getting into Duke. Just enjoy it. Um, if you want to go down an entrepreneurial path, it's hard to get raise money. I would try not to do that. Um, you can work for a startup. You know, that's great. But if you want to do something on your own, you know, like starting a, just trying to get some money, make $5,000 every six months, you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't even be the world's best idea. Just think about something that you are good at, you can do with low risk. You know, if it's like mowing lawns or something, I don't know, get a better way to mow lawns, you know, just, but just try to do something that has low capital risk that allow you to essentially stay unemployed for as long as possible and give you the time and space to figure out what you are good at, um, learn how to, you know, make a lot of mistakes around hiring people and firing people and running a business and, you know, confusing profit with, with uh, revenue like I did. And, um, you know, it's just, it's staying kind of on your own. Um, it's a marathon and you're going to figure it out. And, and it's given me a lot more, I mean, I'm, I'm just so glad that I was able to get through those first few years and, and build a better business um, that sustained me for the, my whole career. Uh, so, you know, but I, just don't put a ton of pressure on yourself. You're just gonna, you're gonna figure it out. That's great. Thank you so much, Brooks. That was awesome. I'm gonna, I'm adding in one little bonus thing here, which is I feel like uh, that you've told the story before about how you and Jesse met at um, the Duke UNC game. And you know, the Duke UNC game is such a pivotal experience for for most um duke students are you willing to to share the story again about about how you i've, I've actually forgotten the story but are you willing to share the story well he uh well we met once right before and i said he was sitting on a couch it was actually the first day before my first day at class and he was and sitting he was, next the, to, he was in the marching band as well or he wasn't no he wasn't um but i was so this is actually we met twice the very first time was the first day of, right before i started my first day of class and he was at an off campus um, party and he had a seat next to him on the couch. So he was sitting on the front porch and he was wearing this uh, shark tooth necklace and it was super cute. So I sat, sat, sat down next to him and I was like, you know, I was kind of on the prowl for, uh, for, you know, for boys. And I asked him if uh, juniors take advantage of freshmen <laughs> and it's like, as my line, um, it's pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty forward. Anyway, it didn't work. He already had plans. Um, anyway, we met again at, after the Duke UNC game and kind of remember each other. And this time it was at the bonfire and he offered, uh, he, well, he said it was getting late. He's going to go to his room and bong some beers with his frat brothers. And they're all going to be, uh, shirtless. And I was like, Oh my God, I want to be part of that. So he, you know, invite, he said I could join them, so I came up and he taught me how to bong a beer, and it was the beginning of a beautiful, you know, relationship. <laughs> I love it. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, so um, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much, Brooke. So, so do you, so you said you had to go at four fifteen. It is yeah. now five. I do have students here. I'm happy to just. Yeah, I, I'll just do. Here. I can do maybe five minutes of um, the questions, and I gotta head out. Head out okay, somewhere. Cool. 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 Um, I'm, I'm just gonna keep the video rolling. You know. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to plan to cut this, but maybe there's just a great question and a great something that that ends up connecting in. Uh, everybody, uh, if you are muted, uh, you can unmute and ask a question. Uh, you know, if you don't have any questions, that's okay. But somebody's probably got some question. And actually, Ray, you were the first one on the here. So do you do you want to be first up to to have a chance? Because you've heard the whole thing. I don't have a question in particular, but I just want to say I really enjoyed um, yeah, hearing about your story first. Um, yeah, and I think it really just, um, what really resonated to me is just like the importance of health. And I also enjoyed hearing the stories about uh, Jesse because I've met him and I think, um, I think he, I met him at HQ Raleigh over the summer. I think he mentioned he started his business, um, his current business based off an idea that like, I think you saw books. So um, it's just, yeah. just pretty interesting to hear all of that. I don't have a Thanks, specific Ray. question. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Yep. Great. Thanks, Ray. You can mute again. And uh, does anybody else have a question? Just unmute or raise your hand. All right. Yao, go ahead and unmute. Hi, Brooks. Thank you so much for doing this with us today. Uh, my name is Yao. Uh, I'm a senior. And my question is with regards to your specific point about analytics. So what is the, what do you think is like, the main reason why people still don't use analytics in like making decisions, whether it's marketing decisions, business decisions, given that it's been around for so long, why are people still not using it? And, and let, me just um, add a little, let me just add a little thing. Brooks, Ray is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Yao is graduating and he's gonna start an analytics company that's focused on helping uh, sports teams perform better, particularly easy mm -hmm. computer games. Yeah. Yeah. Well, data is pretty scary to a lot of people because it can undermine your decision. If you say, this is the right way to go, and then your analyst comes around and says, like, actually, no, it's not, you know, because we have the data to show you're wrong, it'll look really bad. And so it's you, if you do not have data to support it, no one can, like, challenge you. Mm -hmm. um, if you do have data, especially if some other analyst is, like, surfacing it, it's very intimidating to people. And so they start challenging the data. Well, a lot of, of data is wrong. You know, it's not connected, it's not clean. And so it can be pretty dangerous um, as well. If you get data that is not clear or not, not true, but, um, but people don't understand that and it's actually driving you in the wrong direction. So it's just data is a very powerful thing that can be intimidating to a lot of people. Um, and it can also be misused and, and, and not trusted. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one, maybe one more question. Yeah, one more question. Raise your hand if you got one. Francesca, all right. Oscar. Okay. All right. Oh, oh, Francesca, you have one, Francesca, one more? You raise your hand. Yeah, sorry. One sec. Um, I, I unmuted you, Francesca. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, okay, cool. I was going to say, is there any, yeah, first of all, I loved hearing your story and how, um, it's really cool how you're so data driven, but also very intuitively in touch with like yourself and what matters to you. And I completely agree that taking space enables you to get those insights. And I think it's so cool, um, your whole journey and where you're headed. Um, my question is about, um, have there been any books or people in particular that have really inspired you? Um, that, yeah, on your Some journey. Of my favorite books are Influence by uh, um, Cialdini. Um, and so influence the psychology of persuasion is a good classic. It's dated now, but it's, it's, it was really eye opening. And of course, predictably irrational by Dan Ariely. Um, also fantastic. Anything Dan Ariely writes is amazing. Um, those are two of my favorites. So maybe start there. Okay. Brooks, Thanks. we're going to, I'm going to end the video here. Thank you so much. That Thank was you. awesome. I'm going to um, do some light editing and then post this on YouTube. Thanks everybody. You know. Yeah. Okay. So I've gone for 75 minutes. So I think I'm going to be able to finish this, uh, this, I think you're good. this weekend. So I think feeling you, good. You could do a 10 K maybe. So, all right. Yeah. Bye, all right. Brooks. Thanks guys. Thanks so bye. All right. Bye.